Thank you. Uh, okay. So, I hope the title is pretty much uh, self-explanatory. We're going to talk about proxies. We're going to talk about web security. It's pretty much my cup of tea, if you have been following me for the last couple of years. Um, so, first of all, we're going to start this talk by kind of discussing a little bit who is that for? Why actually we're doing these things? Well, first of all, I'm doing it because I'm replacing someone, but that's besides the point. Um, so, who is this talk for? Now, first of all, what are proxies, right? How many of you are using web proxies as part of their daily jobs or other nefarious purposes and stuff, right? Okay. So, mo most of you pretty much are familiar with the concept. So, ge proxies generally are general purpose tools. We use them to intercept the traffic between client and server applications. Now, we're not talking about just web proxies, we're talking about any kind of a proxy. It could be also a proxy that hijacks calls from one application, captures the data, sends it to the user, the user modifies it, pushes it back through the normal streams, um, similarly to what some uh, tools like Echo Mirage and stuff are doing, right? So, based on this definition, this, the target audience for this presentation, for this presentation in particular, are the penetration testers, or as known as pen testers, testing pens, and uh, quality assurance people, people who use proxies on a daily basis, uh, people who are generally interested in security and want to see how things are working, and also, I should add, people who are or live on the edge of innovation. Now, this is a big thing to say. Some people will disagree with me. But what we're going to show today are stuff that I believe personally, in my personal opinion, haven't been done before. And they're pretty new and cutting edge. And sometimes I find it very difficult to explain what they are. Because people already have this sort of uh, stereotype and mindset about this type of tools and how they should work. And so I'm going to show you tools that are very, very different from what you're used to. And uh, because of that, we're going to talk about what is upcoming, what kind of applications we are seeing to test in the near future, um, all exciting stuff. And uh, just as, a, as a, a bit of a warning, if you actually don't know anything about proxies, you might actually find some of the slides lacking information. Okay, that's pretty much what the slides will be like. Picture with a sentence, most of them. So, why web proxies? I would say it's because they actually suck, as uh, French people will say. And uh, I've been working with proxies for the past 10 years, so I've actually seen them. I, see, I know how they work. Every time I get frustrated, I start writing my own proxy. God knows why. Never do that. Uh, you're going to invest a lot of time into, <laughs> into a tool that's not going to work. It's going to basically the same, uh, you know, um, you know, piece of uh, retarded software, uh, but of course it is. It's made from software, so that's, that's to be expected. Um, and web practice generally has been part, a very, very vital part, a big part of the uh, web application security arsenal, and also everybody uses them. Everybody uses tools, uh, commercial tools. Whoops. Hello. Give me a second. There you go. So everybody uses tools like uh, Burp or Zap professionally. And, um, and the question really is for us guys, is that why, why web proxies? Is there time over? And the answer, and I'll give you the answer right now instead of the end, the answer is no. So you can leave now. Their time is not over. But, uh, and I recently, you know, I'm actually the last person to convince you not to use that type of tools, right? Because I've actually wrote recently two more proxies, you know, just writing them for fun, you know, in spare time, you know. Oh, there you go, another one. And, um, but I'm actually owing the support for better tools. And by saying better tools, I mean like tools for me that are easier to use, that are more intuitive. And for me personally, a good tool is a tool that actually gives me a lot of context information. I honest, I'm not one of the guys like from the movies that looks at hexadecimal code all day long. You know, I can't do it. You know, I'd rather have a tool that just tells me the stuff that I don't know. You know, so in other words, the tool for me is my left or right hand. So I want, I want a tool that provides a lot of context information, but not too much, because I'm not going to be able to accept it otherwise. So, so we're going to go along, and we're going to 
talk about this stuff. So, basic security tools, their general purpose, they provided visibility of the comps. Now, here's some stuff, and by the way, uh, why proxies has been so popular during testing is because um, um, not until recently, uh, the humankind were not really building very complex applications. Let's be honest, you know, PHP looks a bit like CGI. And, um, open, you know, recently people started building more complex applications like, you know, using web sockets and, you know, all kinds of crazy technologies are coming right now like WebRTS and stuff like this. So, really, proxies actually came in a, in, a, in a time where there was actually very good need for this type of tools, and they were, you know, they were doing a pretty, pretty good job because of this. In a way, proxies are also a little bit like network sniffers, the way they're designed. You know, you got the, you got the, you got the screen where you can see like, all the traffic coming through, so you can just go up and down. But we're going uh, gonna to go on through the next slides and we're going to show you, it's going to be a bit of a rant about some of the stuff about web proxies that I don't like. So we're building up the presentation gradually until I get you there, right? So, first thing, most of them are written in Java. Now, is, is it because Java is nice? Well, I like Java, but you know, that's probably not the case. Is it because it's easy? Uh, that's probably is the case, uh, but more important is because there is actually previous art. Now, if you look at and you trace the history of like some of these most popular web proxies these days are actually based on Java tools that have been written many years ago. And you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to sort of look at the code and see how this stuff works. Um, you can, you can learn a lot from by reverse engineering the Java proxy, so you can actually recreate the same mechanisms in your own Java applications. It's pretty easy to start. Now, Java also have a very good support for SSL. Typically, it's very high level, a lot of you know, interesting and nice functions to use. Uh, it's not like using OpenSSL or NNS, which is like more low level stuff that you might actually not kind of understand what these constants are all about and what is the right way you call certain, certain functions in the right order and things like that. So it actually makes it easy to do intercepting proxies and stuff like this. Uh, and also, a lot of developers are also Java developers. So that actually helps. This is one of the reasons why uh, proxies are um, written in Java. Now, um, also, because they're written in Java, in my personal opinion, is that they're pretty slow compared to native applications. Uh, that's because, not because Java itself is slow, but because um, this type of tools, they actually take a lot of data, they process a lot of data, they take, um, they actually use a lot of the, the heap size allocated for the virtual machine. And therefore, sometimes when you're playing with a proxy, you need to adjust the right settings just to get it work with certain types of applications. Otherwise, they crash or they perform really, really badly. In many situations, you find, you find the case that the proxy itself is fighting always the kernel in some ways. So in other words, you know, the kernel is doing some stuff like swapping pages from memory to disk and things like that, and the proxy is doing the same thing. And then they're all fighting for like what they actually they don't know what they're doing with each other. You know, one of them is writing to the disk, the other one is taking from memory, then writing to the disk, and it just confused all the time because they are multi-threaded and they actually don't have this sort of a performance enhancements in mind when they were written. Also, going to the next slide, most proxies are buffering. This means that all the requests and responses are buffered before they're displayed to the user. Why this is done so? Well, just purely for UI perspective, you need to show some sort of a traffic to, this, to the user, right? So you want to actually see a request and you see, see what that request is all about. You want to see an image, you want to see what that image is all about. This means that this data needs to be prefetched first and then displayed. So they're not streaming, they're not streamed from one end to another. That makes, um, the whole user experience about proxies are pretty, pretty, um, pretty bad, in my opinion, right? Especially when you work with uh, very, very complex applications that generate a lot of traffic. We didn't come down to this uh, later on. Um, Java is also very, very multi-threaded type of platform. Uh, although you can write, um, you know, non-threaded code, uh, pretty much like an asynchronous code or something like this. But because most people think in terms of threads, most of the code is linear in Java applications. So you're sort of a force to think in mentality of, you know, buffering data, doing for loops and stuff like this. It makes testing quite slow. Um, this is also why when you're working with large files. Uh, 
pretty much uh, it's a disaster. You know, uh, most proxies actually tend not to be able to understand large files. You want to pull like several gigabytes of data through a proxy. That proxy is likely to crash, may not be able to display the stuff. Or some of the more clever proxies, they just ignore the request. It's almost like it never happened. It's just like, OK, there is a large file coming through the pipe. I'm not going to even talk about it. You know, I'll just slip it through. <laughs> almost like it never happened at all, you know, uh, just to, just to make, it, make the whole application work. Now, two strategies can be implemented to kind of overcome this type of problems. And one of them is to, uh, for example, what, what I've seen in the, in, the, in the wild is that one of them is to, um, is to check the content length and just stream the response. Um, but actually, this sort of stuff don't work when you're using more, more uh, different types of encodings, like chunk encoding and stuff like this, because you actually wouldn't know the total content length you know, before you actually receive the stuff you know, from, the, from the server. And it doesn't work really, really well for interception. So I'm just laying out all these problems, right? The second, prop, you know, uh, you know, the second strategy, which is widely used by all proxies, is to use buffering and to buffer the request or the response until you know, everything is in memory and then you ship it to the user. Because of this also, um, these proxies don't have any pipelining built into them. Now, a lot of proxies work on the basis of you make a connection, the connection is pretty much a request. The request is satisfied by a response, and you terminate the connection. It makes it very easy to program the whole thing. The reason being is because it just, it's just simple. Unfortunately, from browser perspectives like Chrome and Firefox, they don't quite work the exact same way. They are designed to be a lot more performant. So for example, if you look at Neko or some of, you know, I don't know the name of what uh, Chrome is using as a network library underneath. but. What they do, they try to pipeline as much requests as possible. But I'm not talking about traditional HTTP pipelining. I'm talking about like keeping the same socket open. Just put one request satisfied, put next request satisfied, put the, you know, the, set, you know, the next one, and so on and so forth. It makes it really, really difficult to write such a piece of software for proxies. Because um, in my experience, what I've done this in the past is that you've got this sort of uh, really basic bugs that we used to have with, uh, you know, like squid and stuff like this, like cache poisoning attacks. But they actually happen on their, you know, on proxies like burp and stuff like this. So that's why there's no pipelining, just keep it simple, but also it's not very, very performant. Next, WebSockets are basically not supported. Now, why they are important? Now, WebSocket is pretty much the next, the next wave of development of a very, very advanced applications. And, and the support at the moment for WebSocket is pretty poor. The reason being is because, keep in mind all these slides before that, right? There's no pipelining. Uh, it doesn't support large requests, right? It is no streaming, it's buffering. So in, in, in theory, WebSockets cannot be supported in a traditional way proxies are written. They just can't work that way. So you need to design not only a completely different user interface, but also the proxy will need to work in a completely different way. Because in a WebSocket world, you establish a connection, and then there is a constant communication, a message is sent from the server to the client, back and forth, you know? So WebSockets are basically not supported. Now, I'm not saying there's not su no support at all. In fact, if you look at some of the open source proxies like Zap, they have some kind of rudimentary plugins that work with the most basic um, sort of WebSocket implementations, but the more advanced ones are pretty much not supported. On the top of that, if you think about it, web proxies are designed to analyze HTTP traffic. Now, when you talk about WebSockets, it could be something that is clear text. It may not be. It could be some kind of a binary protocol that actually you've never seen or you don't even know how it works. So we are, we are back into, uh, uh, you know, sort of tool, tool, tooling that, you know, that uh, help us to do more advanced reverse engineering. That's, that's what we basically need. And this stuff are not supported. Uh, also, not to mention, it doesn't have, they don't have support for stuff like web RTS, stuff like this, you know, things that, okay, they're not everywhere. Chrome has them in their, like, uh, development channels, but, you know, it's the stuff that will likely show up everywhere and people start using it. Plain authentication in web proxies is, uh, is usually uh, quite painful um, in, a, in a way that, for example, uh, 
uh, because some things, uh, for example, some, some applications don't actually support authentication. So in order to enable them, some clients, you need to set up the authentication at the proxy level. So the proxy does the heavy lifting for this client application. Very often, you might actually want to create something like a bash script that doesn't know anything about cookies, doesn't know anything about session management, doesn't know anything about SSL, but you still want to use it to test an application that uses client-side authentication or something like this. Then you know you would think that okay uh, we're gonna set up a um, uh, we're gonna set up a authentication on a proxy. It's actually quite difficult to configure because you need to actually deal with these all these realms. Sometimes it's not that easy, um, and um, because of that, um, because the various authentication schemes and the various ways um, you know uh, you know things can go go uh, when you're testing um, you know they may actually not work. The only problem the problem with this is that even though you think that it's probably working, but actually you don't know until you start analyzing the data at a more granular level. So sometimes it's actually even confusing. So the multi-user support in 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 proxies from authentication point of view is also pretty bad. Going next, SSL authentication is also pretty painful. You know, yeah, you can set up client-side certificates. You know, most proxies allow you to do that sort of things. But you know, Java as a framework itself doesn't actually give you a lot of uh, access. Actually, it's Java is based, as far as I know, to N NNS. So they basically created a very nice wrapper around the Netscape secure socket libraries. And uh, you can do a lot of things with it, but it doesn't. I've, from my experience, uh, there are custom authentications using hardware tokens and things like that, especially when you do banking and, or for example, I think some banks in UK, they actually ship you a device to you, not the ones that are completely wireless, but the one that you actually need to plug into your computer and then you actually need, it's like for corporate banking and stuff, you know, this stuff actually use um, more advanced uh, hardware token based sort of SSL authentication and therefore proxies by default they don't work so people who are working in a banking industry they face the problem that they can't actually use these tools they, they simply can't you know so they need to rely on other, other techniques to you know overcome this problem um, so in, from Java perspective mix and manage code with what Java is, with native code is perhaps, um, I've seen a lot of hacks, but none of them are actually stable. Now, custom authentication is also not quite nice in proxies. Now, if you deal with the very, very simple applications, simple form-based authentication, it works really well. If you deal with applications that just require, you know, like cookies and stuff like this, which is the majority of the applications online, then that's fine, but, you know, as a pen tester, I've seen a lot of applications that are actually not written like that, and they're all customized. If you actually move, you know, go from uh, um, Europe to uh, Asia or something like this, you'll, fi you'll find actually working with technologies that are not even familiar to you. You know, it's a very foreign stuff. Uh, using ActiveX controllers for authentication and whatnot, you know, not even actually using cookies at some point, using something else. Also, if you're thinking about applications that are more high level, like, for example, uh, applications written on Flash that uh, communicate over AMF, they might actually not use any session management system. The session management system probably is, is, is serialized as part of the AMF messages that are sent back and forth from the server. Uh, if you use something like GWT, you can also do that sort of thing. So it's not necessarily when we're talking about web applications, it doesn't imply that actually there is a session management system going on. You know, especially with the new types of web applications that I've seen lately, the stuff that are based on web sockets, that is totally optional. You know, whether I'll do it as a cookies or whether I'll send this data over a web socket, it's completely optional. So therefore, proxies actually don't have this sort of support for custom authentication, and perhaps you can extend proxy through some sort of a plugins, which is an option, but then you need to create a plugin for every single custom authentication that you see in the wild. And sooner or later, that becomes uh, quite of a burden. Is also, there's a maintenance problem. Uh, also, you need to know how to do it properly, and, and so on and so forth. Generally speaking, proxies are pretty much uh, proxies are pretty much uh, time consuming to set up. Everything is just a request and response, no understanding of their purpose and function. By saying this is about from the proxy perspective, every application looks the same. It's just a series of requests and responses. Now, that was fine in the CGI world, but it's not fine today because most of pages these days, they're not rendered as 
HTML pages. They actually, you know, you load the application, perhaps not even from the server, you load it from cache. So actually there's no request made to the, from the server. All the functionalities are just pure client side, JavaScript and stuff like this. And then the application makes just some calls, maybe establishes a web socket for fast communication, and it takes it from there. Um, proxies generally don't pass the grandma test for ease of use. That's my opinion. And as this next slide says, from Charles Dunn is a quote, that the most intelligent, uh, the most strongest, not the most strongest species uh, or the most intelligent will survive, but, um, but the one that with the most, uh, the one that most, uh, that responsive to change. Generally speaking, proxies are stuck in age when Achilles was popular. Now, how many of you remember Achilles? That was one of the, I would say, probably the first proxies. I mean, quote me if I'm wrong. Maybe there, is, there was another one before that, so please apologies, you know? But that was one of the first popular ones. So, we are basically stuck in Achilles land. So if you see Achilles, I don't know when it was written, but I remember, I, I vaguely remember using this in 2001, two or something like this, you know? So maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but if you see it from this uh, fuzzy picture, and I did it fuzzy because actually the, the screenshot was pretty bad, you know, so I had to make it fuzzy to look better on the screen. Um, it's pretty much the same stuff that we see today. So for the last 11 years, no innovation whatsoever. We're using the same rudimentary tools that we have been using for the last 10 years to test applications that drastically ch shifted from CGI to completely modern client-side stack with awesome, awesome technologies, right? Now, what is this client-side stack of awesome technologies? This, okay? This is basically a game that is called, I'll do a demo for you. This is a game called Banana Bread. Effectively, that's a 3D shooter. It's pretty good, by the way. It, it, it is, I would say, from, from a, um, uh, I don't know, from uh, uh, 3D graphics point of view, using just WebGL, it is a damn good, you know, implementation of a game. You know, it's, it does, it has a really good water effects, it has a very good, water, you know, lava effects. It's a, just a proof of concept. But basically it gives you an idea where this browser technology is heading. Effectively the browser is the ultimate client, you know, it's the most general purpose client. Um, it has, um, uh, so, so imagine that the situation where we are testing maybe two years from now, you know, we are testing actually a proper games, and you know, these games, they're not gonna do like RPC requests to uh, you know, some JSON serialized data and stuff like this that is easy for us to see. You know, everybody who has seen like some of the protocols that Battle.net is using, this is not like something that is, readable in any, any way, you know, you need to actually understand the protocol because it's pretty much serialized, you know, some serialized data, you know, when you're transferring a number, you're not actually writing the number, let's say one in ASCII, which takes eight bits, you might actually, you know, write something smaller that just takes one bit, like the Google uh, protobufs, uh, variable integers and stuff like this. Uh, that also is confirmed by this thing. Now this, my friends, is the Unreal 3 engine running on a, uh, a project called uh, Assam.js, and it works really, really well. That's Unreal 3, you know? So we're talking about like a really high-end gaming, potentially running on browser technologies. This is absolutely possible, even with today's moderate hardware, you know? You don't need Flash. You have a good acceleration of 3D graphics via WebGL. You have a very, very powerful client like Google Chrome and Firefox. Now Google Chrome JavaScript engine is really fast. It's not an interpreter. It's not a JavaScript interpreter. It's a JavaScript compiler. It doesn't have interpretation mode. It doesn't interpret anything. It doesn't parse strings. It parses strings the first time. Then after that is basically memory, you know? So basically the, the stuff that you load, even if it's a lot of stuff, in, into uh, a lot of code that you load, it can run as smoothly as you, as you want. And with today, multi-process architecture browsers, they 
they're pretty much right there, maybe with the, okay, maybe not exactly right there, but the improvements that I see happening in the next one or two years is going to enable this type of applications, very, very rich applications, to work in a browser environment. But to test an application like this one, that's not going to work in a web proxy, you know, but it's still a requirement. So I'm not saying that all the applications are going to be 3D, but some of them will be, you know, some of them will be games. So we are left with two choices. We either need to engineer something completely custom, or we need to shift our focus from the way we perceive web proxies in the old way to the new way, where we perceive the proxy tools in a completely, com completely different uh, and re you know, refreshing point of view, right? So as I said before, the ultimate client is really the browser, the most powerful client ever built. Just to give you some statistics, uh, Google Chrome, pretty new browser, it has 7 million lines of code in total. Now, I'm not saying that all the code comes you know, as a packaged application, but uh, you know, that's, that's the roughly the lines. Uh, Firefox has 9 million lines of code. Now, the Linux kernel has 14 million lines of code. So they're actually not that far from being pretty big you know, in terms of like the, the you know, amount of work that has been put in to make these technologies, right? Also, if you look at, like, uh, uh, I, I tried recently to download the Google Chrome and compile it, and I gave up, you know? Why? Because the source is, like, one point something gigabytes. Compressed star file. Who does that? <laughs> you know? You would imagine the source to be a lot less than this. And they say, like, yeah, we need, like, a quad-core processor with, I don't know, 16 gigabytes of RAM to compile it and, uh, you know, 10 gigabytes of disk space. Yeah, right, <laughs> you know. There are some guys on GitHub, they compiled it, so I downloaded it from them, you know. So, so, you know, this is not really, you know, it's not a... It's not a and as far as I know on, on Firefox, they actually can't compile it if my memory correct, you know, uh, this doesn't deceive me, but they can't compile it on Windows 32. Win 32, it's just not possible because the, the memory they need to allocate for some operation is so big, they run out of space immediately, you know? So they try to do some hacks by splitting the work in an individual. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert, you know, they do have actually compiled uh, various components for Firefox uh, and the Mozilla, you know, runtime on some of my projects, and it was working fine, but, you know, by reading some forums, people were, at some point were saying, okay, we can't support this, uh, you know, version of Visual Studio, we can't support the architecture because we just can't compile for this, you know, it's just our code is so much that it just wouldn't fit into the memory, you know. So, yeah, a lot of, it's a, it's a lot of numbers, millions of lines of code. So because of this, what I'm trying to convey here is that the browser as a client already packs an awesome power, you know, like a, a technology that is pretty much universal in many, many ways. So since all applications that we were talking about, like, you know, gaming, uh, you know, all kinds of applications, modern, new, CGI, or whatever they are, they're moving to the web, and even most basic or rudimentary types of hardware that you will buy today, like TVs, like uh, toasters, they have web interfaces that you access via a web browser, it makes perfect sense to shift that proxy thing that we were talking about from a third-party client into the client, which is the actual browser. So that's what we're going to be talking about next. So some of the stuff that are built into the browser. You've got HTML5, good for rendering. I'm not going to talk about it too much. But it's pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, technology for building modern types of applications, good looking. You've got JavaScript. Now JavaScript, it's not my favorite language. It's not a programming language. It is a scripting language, and it's a huge difference between them. Um, if you go to uh, Mozilla, one of my favorite platforms, it packs two really good technologies, Neko and XPCOM. I hear that they will scrap XPCOM. I hope they don't, you know? But this is like one of the most, you know, extensible things that I've seen online. It's, it goes after the Microsoft Comp technology, but it's even better because it's a cross-platform. It's not binary compatible anymore from, from one version of uh, Firefox of another, but effectively, if all the components of Firefox are written as, com as if all the features of Firefox are written as components, you can, you can effectively replace every single feature without recompiling the whole Firefox. So let's say that I want to replace the way FTP works in Firefox. I just write a new, 
you know, Firefox component registry it without, without ID, and then I can replace the standard FTP functionalities with my own functionality. So it allows greater extensibility. Now, if we go to the Chrome side of things, Chrome exposes a lot of APIs. They're usually very high level. And that's why a lot of people say, hey, Chrome is really, really fast, you know, when there's no plugins. Well, the reason being is because they actually don't allow you to muck about with the architecture too much. They just give you some user-friendly APIs. You call this function, pretty much a kid's play, and then you have uh, some functionality. Nevertheless, even with these limitations, Chrome can do cross-domain calls. It can do sockets like TCP and UDP sockets. It can do request and response monitoring. Um, and you know, whatever it cannot support, you can write as an NPAPI plugin, and it will, it will work fine in this environment. So technically speaking, we've got this, this pack uh, uh, of uh, browsers, uh, all of them uh, working in its own way, that uh, we can probably lift their, all their power, and we can use it for, for security testing and whatnot. We also, if we develop everything as a browser sort of application, and we think in that mentality, it becomes a very, very portable piece of technology. So what I'm going to show you next is actually applications that also run in a Chromebook. And the Chromebook only has a browser. It doesn't have anything else. But I can quite easily take a Chromebook and go to a job, and I can do a job by a Chromebook. No problem. You know? Not until recently, you, we wouldn't be able to do that. You could probably use the debugger tools and stuff like this, but that's not going to be very nice. So just to show you a little bit of this, uh, the progress of the technology I'll show you later, it's actually not quite new, because some of the work that I started, uh, it took like uh, almost seven years to formulize in my head, generally, how it's going to look like. So back in 2005, 2006, circa, there was a library that I developed called Attack API. It's dead now, um, for, for good. Uh, then in 2006, 2007, there was a, a tool for Firefox called Technica, which is like a browser security scripting environment. Again, this is dead. Then in, uh, in uh, Aus, Aus, Ausert, I think in 2009, I demonstrated this tool called Weaponry, which was written on top of uh, XUL. Uh, it's another Mozilla technology, which uh, kind of was expanding on the idea of using browsers as security testing tools. That one is also, uh, in some ways, dead for good. And what we, I'm working right now is a set of tools, and I'm going to talk about them, that uh, lifts all the stuff, all the, all the techniques that I've learned from the previous years, for the last seven years, and it puts them in a completely different dimension, and just show you some of these tools and how they work. So that's basically is the suit. Now, what is the suit? The suit is effectively just a client-side code. So you go to a website. The website gives you a piece of functionality, a lot of code. I'll show you on the screen how much is it. It's a lot. And it, the browser takes this piece of functionality, and it starts you know, rendering it on screen. There's no client. There's no server in this case. So in other, in other words, all the stuff that we're going to be doing, they're going to run effectively from your browser. So if somebody thinks, oh, we can use these tools, and we're going to hack someone, and then it's going to look like you're coming from a different IP address, no, you're going to actually come from your own network. You know, so don't do that. And uh, because all this stuff actually executes from your own browser. Just to give you an example of the differences between this and uh, software as a service is that one of them runs in the browser, the other one runs in the cloud. It's pretty simple. Once one of them runs in your own hardware, the other one runs in a different hardware. It's instant versus Qt. You know, if you use something like Qualys or maybe some of the other stuff, uh, you know, you basically put a job onto a server. The server needs to perform the job, then comes back the result. That basically doesn't exist. It's effectively a, a application. You know, I would say it's an application. It's not a website. It's an application. So what do they do? I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture, and then I'll show you some demos. So first of all, the way the whole thing works is that by, you can't write it just like that. You might think that, oh, I'm going to start writing JavaScript tomorrow, and it's going to work. After seven years of trying to do that, I realized that's not possible. And I stress again, JavaScript is a scripting language. It's not a programming language. You can't program. You can glue things together. Uh, it is a very good for assembling stuff. That's why a lot of people say, yeah, JavaScript is the assembler of the web. They're pretty much correct. You know, assemble is also pretty good and neat 
uh, type of language, but you know, it's not for like the faint-hearted, you know? So you can't write a po complex piece of software. So in order to make all this stuff work, uh, we had to effectively scrape the use of JavaScript and write our own compiler on, be on the top of a custom programming language that we found familiar and easy to use. So we use a, a, a custom language, write the code in, do all the unit testing and all the stuff, just like any general purpose programming language, then use a compiler, the compiler translates it into JavaScript, and it puts it into, into the browser. Unfortunately, not everything will work uh, this way, because as you might know, the Java, you know, browsers have their own security policies and, and security restrictions, so therefore we need also a very lightweight extension on the top of that. What this extension does, it just kicks in in situations where we want to perform an action that is usually not allowed for us to do. So just keep in mind that everything is retrieved from a website, Therefore, you need to allow that website to do like cross-domain communication, you need to use sockets, you know, this sort of stuff are typically not allowed for the application to use yet, you know. Uh, I think Mozilla is having this, uh, this thing in a pipeline, the Mozilla Marketplace, which allows you to create web applications and you can define intents, and one of the intents is like, you know, use sockets, for example, or something like this. So when you install the application, it's gonna ask you, well, do you want this to allow this application to use a socket? And then, you know, this sort of a high-level API is going to be provided to this application. So, you know, we don't have this functionality yet in normal browsers, but we will have maybe the next couple of years. So the way this thing works from an architectural point of view, you've got the extension in the middle, the extension acts as a, some kind of arbiter, so we actually send a lot of the commands from the extension, then they go to the, let's say, the target that we're testing, the stuff come back, and they go back to our code. Also, we can, this, this whole situation can get a little bit more trickier when we use something called web workers. The reason we use web workers is because you want to make it look more multi-threaded. Just if you do a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of stuff in an in a, in a, in a environment like the browser, you might actually lock it and it's not going to allow to render properly and definitely you're going to get one of these nasty boxes to say to terminate the script. So in order to avoid this, you need to run it into one of these like sub-processes like a worker. But to do a worker, then you need to do also more, more levels of indirection. But to actually get all these like, little parts work in a, in a, in a good way, uh, that cannot be done in a <laughs> human way. You, know? you need to almost compile it in somehow you know, to make it work. So using this uh, set of uh, things, we can, do, we can send requests on a, to any arbitrary point. We can intercept transactions. By saying transaction, we can intercept requests and responses. And we can also access low-level APIs. So what I'm going to do next, for the next 20 minutes, is just show you uh, some of this stuff in action. Now, uh, some of the stuff I'm going to show you, uh, we, we use these tools, by the way, to discover vulnerabilities in the bug, bug bounty programs. You know? And one of them was in PayPal, which we got paid. And then uh, I was testing yesterday, and it turns out it's still there. So I'm still thinking, should I show it to you? I don't know. We'll see. Um, okay. Now, first of all, before I move on, I want to show you this. This is the uh, banana bread application I was talking about. So if I, if I do this, okay. I, I mean, the resolution is pretty crappy because I, I need to do it here. Uh, I, but, you know, that's a 3D shooter that runs from a browser. It's pretty good. Okay, I don't have a very good control over the mouse because I'm displaying on the, on, the, on the secondary monitor. But, you know, you have to admit that this is a very, very good implementation, you know, of a game. You know, this is the kind of software I expect to have, you know, to uh, start seeing very time, uh, any, you know, soon. Now, show mirroring. Options. Um, okay, I'm going to try to mirror my displays just to make it easier for me. The worst thing about having a retina display is that now everything looks really bad. Um, okay, so hopefully that should work. So. I'm going to show you some of these tools. So, now, this tool is effectively just a scanner. 
Now, I want to sh show you some of the sources of how this tool is made. This is pretty much the code. It's almost there, guys. Almost there. There you go. Okay. Now, this is a lot of client-side code that needs to be processed, right? Interestingly enough, oops, I don't have internet. Sorry about that. Uh, let me see. Uh, No internet. Huh? Yeah, I can't use cable on this mic. You know, Apple eliminated all the good features. <laughs> it's all wireless these days. Uh, do not fear. I'm going to launch a VM. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to show you something else. Ah, oh, there is an internet. Okay, I'm going to try to... Uh... Oh, yeah, I know why. I know why. I'll tell you why. I'm using, actually, this plugin here. I'm going to talk about it later. It's basically Poorsman VPN extension. I'll just turn it off. <laughs> now we can do it. <laughs> okay. So, there you go. It's pretty responsive. Ta-da! You know, we can do whatever. We actually ask to do authentication. We don't want to authenticate. And, you know, all the stuff are running from the browser, just as normal, you know, any other applications. Thank you. And, but, what do we have find here? You know, we find SQL injections. We find cross site scripting. You know, we find whatever, some other, you know, stuff. Now, all this stuff actually run as this client-side application. We haven't installed anything apart from this lightweight extension just to make the whole thing happen, right? So everything is pretty much run in the client, and that's the main thing. Now, because we are talking about proxies, I want to show you this tool, which basically it's, a, it's like a proxy. It is a proxy, but effectively it's not really a proxy because nothing is being proxied. So if I want to go to Google and I start searching for some stuff, uh, you know, it starts actually recording these requests here. You know, so now I can basically analyze them in a typical way that I will analyze any other application, right? The only difference is, is that we're not installing a proxy. The other difference is, is that we don't care, for example, uh, if the proxy will support this SSL authentication or that custom protocol. I don't care. If the browser can actually, if your application can display and work in a browser, is going to run through this tool just fine. You know, so if you use, let's say, some kind of a custom client-side authentication using a weird technology and NPAPI plugins and stuff like this, that is not a problem because all this stuff will be visible straight away and I don't need to, um, I don't need to do any sort of a clever magic. On the top of this, you know how this, uh, this uh, uh, usually, well, here it's not displayed because this feature is not written yet. But typically, on a proxy level, you don't actually know what request, which re for what reason the request was made for. You just need a request. You see a request and you see a response. You don't know why. You, know? you don't know if that was, a, let's say, an embedded image. You don't know if that actually comes from a subframe. You don't know if that comes from a tab that is related to the application or a pop-up window. You have none of this information. Why would I need this information? Well, to filter the traffic. I'm certainly not interested in static images. Maybe you can filter them out via .jpg and stuff like this and via content type. But actually, sometimes, some images are generated dynamically. So not all images should be excluded. I need to look at some images that are generated dynamically because potentially there's bugs in them, right? Uh, but how would I do that? 
It can't filter by MIME type, right? So one of the easiest ways to do that is because we run in a browser, we have all this meta information that was not available before. We know which tab made this information. We know which subframe made this, this, this request. We know if that was embedded in the DOM when the DOM was retrieved as a static page or was generated you know, by some piece of JavaScript functionality, you know? We actually have this sort of stuff. So now we can not only map the application in terms of, oh, this is the directory structure, we can also map it in terms of, this is how the application works. So we can actually create a workflow that says, this functionality lists that request, lists this, lists that, right? So we can map this. Now, the software for this sort of stuff is not written yet, but, you know, if you, if you want to write it with me, with me you know, then uh, feel free to, uh, you know, talk to me after this. Uh, so, so as you can see, we can do this stuff, and we can, we can, for example, uh, let's say, uh, you know, do the same stuff like a proxy. Uh, just give it a second; I need to reload. Uh, and you know, I can get the same piece of functionality. I can replay a request. I can modify it. You know, the same, same stuff. I can, I can do whatever I want here. You know, similarly to what proxies are with the exception that if there was now a client-side authentication going on, I don't have to set it up because I've already, if the browser has already authenticated, uh, in other words, the application. So it's, for me, it's easier. Um, now, here's another piece of application, which is one of my favorites. So what I wanted to show you is how we can, we can find some bugs. And and potentially make also some, some money out of this. Now, I do this sort of stuff for fun. I mean, lately I don't have a lot of time for research. I'm, I'm writing proxies. Uh, but, uh, for example, if you, if, we, if you want to do, let's say, PayPal, okay. The reason I'm choosing PayPal, I'll tell you why, is because this application is low-hanging fruit discoverer. You know, it takes like two seconds to, to discover things. And it just looks for low-hanging fruit. There is nothing really amazing about it, you know. Uh, but it, when it looks for this low-hanging fruit, it also looks in a very, very large scale. So just because I type PayPal.com right now, it doesn't just look at PayPal.com. It actually looks at everywhere, at all the PayPal estate. Effectively, it's a public estate that I have of different kinds of applications. So it's going to look at virtual hosts, it's going to look like subdomains, it's going to look at this stuff. And it's not going to perform any types of scans, like, for example, cro you know, fuzzing to find SQL ingestion, cross scripting, and stuff like this. It's not going to look for that sort of stuff because it's not intrusive in any ways. But what it will do, it will try to define, to find some sort of, a, you know, maybe misconfigurations, maybe admin pages, maybe default, default credentials, uh, and things like that. So if I leave this thing open, and meanwhile, I can just start another one and do one for Microsoft. I know that some people from the public here is going to be excited to see that. And uh, we're going to do one for, let's do all bug bounty programs, you know. Yandex is the next one. Hey, Facebook. So all this functionality is just running the browser. Um, let's see. Now, you saw the piece of code that, you know, you, this piece of code that I showed you before that? I saw, uh, so, uh, you know, I, to, uh, I, I showed you before that. Uh, this is, even with this, and we were with so many fun, you know, things running at the same time, it, it still behaves pretty, pretty nicely, you know, as a, as a, as a client-side application. Now, this is pretty much all the, the for example, the domains that Facebook at the moment has uh, that are virtual hosts uh, for various things, you know, that maybe we want to explore. Interestingly enough, for some weird reason, uh, mediacenter.org is also a Facebook thing. I don't know. And <laughs> some other stuff, you know. So I'm not quite sure if this is part of their CDNs or something. Womanpress.com. Why? Don't know. <laughs> okay. 
And uh, obviously this tool, as I said, it's a low hanging fruit tool. So it basically pinpoints you to the right direction, but actually doesn't tell you what the vulnerability is. Uh, sometimes in the case of PayPal, it did discover some issues. I tested it yesterday. If it was a problem, uh, this is the one. It's a really, really stupid problem. It's basically a cross-domain XML file, which is like, uh, it's like, it's like easy money, you know, if you report this to PayPal. But the problem is that it's still, it's still an issue, you know. If you actually, if they have this on their website, especially in this place, this means that their website is going to be cross scriptable you know, uh, which is effectively within the rules of the bug bounty program, you know. So, but you know, you know, you know. My point is that we actually leverage the technology that is already in a browser to perform testing on a large scale. In fact, as one of the, one of the stuff that we did as, uh, as part of the research is to uh, use a browser-based uh, uh, technology running in a headless mode. So essentially, this is what you see here, but there's no visual interface. It's running in a, in a headless X server, effectively, right, to scan the internet. So that was the idea, that was the challenge. Can we use a browser to scan the entire internet and find all the low hanging fruit, you know, that is in there. And writing this was a piece of cake, you know. Uh, Runtime for the whole thing took about 30 minutes because we were just hitting the front page. We were not actually doing any spidering or anything like that. Just like, you know, downloading Alexa 1 million, you know, uh, re uh, you know iterate over their subdomains, uh, find their virtual hosts, you know, and go on like this in a recursive mode and just go on as far as deep as we can, you know. And some of the stuff that you discover are absolutely hilarious, you know. Um, you know, there's no word to explain, you know. You have to see it for yourself. Uh, so, now we can also do some more advanced types of tests, like for example fuzzing, you know. Now, this is not going to work because I'm actually testing against a service that doesn't support XML, uh, JSON. But for example, we can, you know, we can do like some stuff that will require a lot of permutations, and mutation of data. So you would expect everybody who is familiar with uh, Cartesian products will probably know that one of the biggest problems with web applications and testing web applications is that if you want to be complete in your tests, you need to perform tests on all the permutations and combinations of a form with all the payloads that you want to send. So now imagine the situation, imagine the scale of this. If you have a form, that allows you to select a, a country, you know? So you have three fields, and then there is a drop down for a country. I don't know, thousands of requests right there, you know? So it's, a, it's basically a very, very complex product, uh, Cartesian product, right? And the way it, it has to be done, you can't pre-generate it, because that's a lot of values, because you're not computing some kind of a rainbow table of all the values. Uh, you essentially need to generate it on the fly. So you actually don't even know how big the Cartesian, well, you actually can compute the, how big the Cartesian product will be. But it's still a very computationally intense process. And, uh, you know, this sort of stuff, you know, we can actually do quite easily using JavaScript, you know? It works really, really well. It's been designed to do that sort of things absolutely amazingly well. You know, so if I can, if I want to create like a very complex JSON structure that has, uh, uh, you know, some stuff and, you know, it has an array and the array has an object and the object has a value and the value has an array and it has an object and it has a value, you know, you would imagine this is pretty, uh, pretty complex to fuzz because there's a lot of computation that needs to be performed. Oh, damn it. Ah, there you go. I made a mistake. Not quite sure where the mistake is, but it's somewhere here. But the, the idea is that uh, we can, we can, uh, we can mutate over these values, so I'm not going to waste time on this because I want to show you some other stuff. Now, we can also do a lot of other clever things, such as, for example, uh, this is one of my favorite ones because it allows you to create a very complex types of cross request forgeries. Now, typically, cross request forgeries are, are quite simplistic you know, by nature, but you know, if you want to do something more complex, like, for example, that you want to send some sort of uh, uh, XML payloads to, for example, um, soap service of some kind or something like this, that, that's not that trivial to do. 
in normal web browsers. And the reason being is because uh, you can't fool the browser to send that sort of stuff and not be uh, attending the same origin policies and stuff. But using trickeries, you can actually do this sort of things. But you need to write a lot of client-side code to actually uplift that functionality and, and make it work, even on the browsers that don't have this type of plugins. And, uh, and okay, here's another example that is very good. This is a tool that is called Reburp. And the reason, the reason we wrote this tool is because we also bur use Burp, because it's, it's a good tool, you know, we use Burp all the time. But unfortunately, Burp loads Burp files really slowly. I hate, I hate it. So that's why we wrote a tool that loads Burp files like that, you know, quickly. <laughs> uh, and it's basically, you know, it's the same file, but, you know, it's loaded by JavaScript, uh, and uh, it's really, really, really quick. So no Java functionality in there. And uh, there's a bunch of other, of other things. Now, uh, this is kind of a done. Oh, yeah, this is Microsoft again. They, use a, they have a similar problem. And uh, again, if you look at their estate, you can actually discover a lot of what they're doing. Uh, for example, what sort of estate they have. You know, what is public, and uh, sometimes you discover admin interfaces. I found out something quite interesting I want to share with you. Um, it turns out there's a lot of websites out there that treat SSL literally as a secure HTTP. So on normal HTTP, there's a normal website, but if you change to HTTPS, you're logged in. And uh, we found this by just scanning the internet. You know, for some reason, I don't know, it works. So. I think I've got a few minutes to wrap up. So, I'm going to skip this. Actually, we wrote a proxy, which is called Badass Proxy. So if you actually still want, uh, it's, a, it's a free tool. Uh, and if you want to still look into uh, this sort of stuff, the only difference between this proxy and the normal proxies, I'm going to show you a screenshot, because I don't have it installed here. It's, this is how it looks like. The only difference is that what you see here, that's all, all HTML and JavaScript. And the whole proxy is written in such a way that there is no buffering happening at any stage in time. So when you select a particular transaction, it's not guaranteed that you actually see the whole thing. You may be seeing the whole thing, it may not be. Who knows? You don't know, you know? So if it's a large request that is five gigabytes or something like this, you will just see partially because the request is still pending, you know, upload. But there is no point in the whole situation where we actually buffer the requests and stuff like this. Now, the way this thing is done is that you've got a backend server, which is written in, uh, in Node.js, and we've got a little uh, piece of utility, which is also free, which is called Proxify. It's, like a, it's, a, it's a C program that does the heavy lifting from the proxy point of view. So everything is chained together, and we communicate the whole thing via web sockets. And it's actually really, really... Uh, uh, responsive to all kinds of changes. So this is, if we stick to making proxies, what we need to do is to change the way we, we make them. So instead of actually having this sort of a buffer thing going on with no way of new application working on this, we need to change them in a way that it's, it's streaming all the time. So the proxy itself has the functionality for as a streaming server. And what is next? Um, the thing is that I don't know what is next. Uh, we actually, um, you know, collaborating with um, a lot of guys from uh, UK who are researchers and writing tools and stuff like this, and we want to find uh, the next, next, next big thing. You know, we have found something that for us is the next big thing. It's like a, it's like a, it's a new way of doing things. But we're also working to um, to deliver more interesting solutions. So, just to a bit of a secret, which is not going to be a secret anymore, you know, since I'm going to share with you some of the tools that's going to uh, come up is going to be related to SQL injection and stuff like this. So, you're going to have an entire SQL injection environment that, you know, almost like SQL Map or SQL Ninja that will execute entirely from, uh, from the browser itself or, you know, very, very complex workflow applications that for all kinds of stuff. And uh, I've, got, uh, I've got two minutes, pretty much, for you if you have any questions. Any questions from the floor? No? Or oh, PDP will also be available for these two days at the conference, so feel free to approach him directly if you have any questions. Oh! Sorry. Um, thank you for your talk. But during your talk, I tested your foundation scanner, and it's very nice. 
Um, but I was thinking, how does this legally work? I just ended some website, I knew that, that was vulnerable, but who's responsible at this point for anything that might break? Right. So it's a good question, right? It's, it's a very, very good question. And that's something that uh, uh, I also very, feel very personally, um, you know, relating to my work, right? Now, if you, t if you take tools like Recon, for example, there's no way the application could break under Recon, because what Recon does is a passive analysis, you know? In fact, Google is probably more intrusive in the way it spiders the website, you know? So it's a very, very lightweight, and it just tries to figure out what is the vulner vulnerable based on the information that is given, you know, based on versions, based on stuff like this. Now, if you use something like the scanner, well, you can't just use it against any website. It's going to be completely illegal, you know? I mean, if you break it, you're pretty much responsible for it, you know? And I'm pretty much sure that most of the websites will have terms of service that prohibits you from doing that sort of things. Now, obviously, I need to make a caveat where, you know, if you use it, if you use to test, let's say, something like a SharePoint website or WordPress website or something like this, if, you, if you're logged in with admin credential, you'll potentially destroy the site, you know? You'll delete it and things like that. Now, this is a problem that every single scanner has and it needs to be configured. Our solution to this problem is that because we've got this sort of framework, we don't think in terms like we're going to write a general purpose scanner. We write specific scanner. So that's why one of the scanners that uh, I'm currently working on is a WordPress scanner and one, another one which is like SharePoint scanner. There's no way you can break your website under the SharePoint scan because the SharePoint scanner is actually configured in such a way that it's not going to test SharePoint specific functionalities, but it's going to test only for the customizations of SharePoint, which is a lot lightweight. So therefore, the chance of break it, you know, breaking something, it's a, a lot less. I'm not sure if this answers your question. Uh, in part, I think, um, well, this can actually happen from my IP address, mm -hmm. but you make it very easy for anybody uh, out there to fill in a uh, URL and scan it. Mm -hmm. it's, you showed that this passes the grandma test, I think. So now anybody can actually just start scanning at random. Yeah, of Do course. Of course everybody can start scanning. It's not, do it's not different than this current situation. It just makes it simpler, you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, before Metasploit, you were downloading, you know, most people who actually either write the exploit or download it and compile it and run it, you know? I mean, after Metasploit, everything is pretty much a subversion update, you know? And then you go to tools, you know? And you can just launch them, you know? You can write a simple UI that your grandma can use, you know, basically. I believe we're out of time for questions. We can take a short one if there's any more from the floor. PDP, is that all right? One last one. Eh? Yeah, sure. Um, of course, it's a client-side tool, so the code is here. I mean, we can see the code, but is it really open source, like the license? Have you released it, like, on GitHub or something? The, the amount, it's an interesting question. We've got open source, not open source tools, no. <laughs> it's not open source. <laughs> Why? Uh, you know, security has changed quite a bit since uh, the days when people were doing it for the glory, you know. <laughs> These days, to, you know, if you've seen some other presentations, it actually takes a lot of time to develop a proper toolkit. This is not something that you're going to write in your spare time over two days, you know, uh, weekend. That's something you spend seven years to develop as a concept, and then you, you want to, you know, do something great with it. In order to do something great with it, basically need some kind of financial support. So although we want to enable our tools to be used, and by the way, we're speaking to universities in, uh, in the Netherlands to give it away to students for free, you know, to use. We're speaking to some universities in Italy, again, you know. Although we want to be the good uh, Sumerian as well, we need to support the community for corporations and individuals. There's only one tool at the moment that is free. Everything else completely commercial. I'm not sure if this answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, PDP. Okay. And thanks, everyone. We're now going to take a quick break before we continue the next talk in 30 minutes' time. Thanks, PDP. Thank you.